You're listening to The Authenticity Show, where you get to eavesdrop on great conversations about health, creativity, and the quest for excellence. Your hosts are Carlos Casados and Satch Purcell. Our guest today is Dr. Tara Rasta. Tara Rasta was born in Iran and moved to the U.S. as a refugee with her family at the age of 14. She went to UCLA and received her Bachelor's of Science in Psychobiology with an emphasis on neuroscience and later became a doctor of chiropractic. She currently works with a special technique of chiropractic called network spinal analysis, which we will get into, and she also practices functional wellness. One of the many reasons I love doing this podcast is that I get to meet really intelligent, interesting people like Tara Rasta. This is a great interview. I really encourage you to listen to the whole thing. And if you like the show, please remember to subscribe. All right, here we go. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Well, here we are in the living room where all the magic happens. This is it, right by the books. We've got a special guest tonight, and I'm really, really glad that you came, Tara Rasta. Thank you. Um, It's a pleasure speaking with you. Welcome to the show. Satch, it's always great to see you, buddy. Good to see you, my man. Yeah, here we are again. So, Mm. uh, you know, by the way, everybody, Carlos is the master at meeting amazing people. Most of the amazing people I know are because of Carlos. Everybody in this room, I know because of Carlos, right? So it's going to be exciting to get to know you too, Tara. Thank you so much. So may I ask you, Dr. Tara, um, how did this all begin for you as far as like, getting into the healing path. Was there something that drove you, like many people who've gotten into healing? That... Yes, I am from Iran. Mm-hmm. My dad was a political activist. Um, he was in prison most of his 20s Wow. Uh, during the revolution. And I was born after the revolution. But my brother grew up in the war that happened after the revolution between Iran and Iraq. When he was nine years old, my dad came out of the prison. So I would say that I grew up in a lot of trauma because the whole country had to face a lot of trauma, and then my family, they faced a lot of trauma on their own. So that really got me into wanting to be a healer, because in the bottom of my heart, I just wanted to heal my family, Mm. which, by the way, I don't know if that is ever going to happen, (laughs) because at the end of the day, we have to be our own healers. But it had started me into um, going into the path of learning about the brain, because I thought if I could really hack the brain, that I would be able to hack my own brain first to heal my own traumas and then help my family. So that got me into uh, studying psychobiology, which is a, studying the how the psychology affects the biology and how the biology affects the psychology, and then going uh, and getting my minor in neuroscience and understanding really the chemistry and the synapses and the details of the brain. Mm. And then after that, I wanted to go to medical school, but... I really didn't feel like that was going to heal what had happened. Mm -hmm. So that got me into chiropractic school, which chiropractic means done by hand. And I always thought the power of touch is so powerful because anytime there was a trauma at home, I really wanted to go hug my dad. I really wanted to go hug my brother. And I thought that was really healing. Mm. So that really got me into chiropractic school. But when chiropractic school was over and I started working as a chiropractor, it didn't feel like what I went to school was, you know, I didn't feel like I was a healer. I didn't feel like people were transforming when they came in and they got their structural adjustment. And not to say that structural adjustments aren't powerful, but that was just my experience. Mm -hmm. So one day I'm in the car and I'm talking to God and I'm really angry at God because I said, God, you got me into chiropractic school. I've done so many years of schooling and I don't feel like I'm living my purpose. So what do you want me to do? What is there that I need to do because I really feel like there is something inside of me, but it's just not coming out with the chiropractic, with the structural adjustment. So I'm crying, I'm talking to God. I get home and my roommate asked me, what's going on? And I said, you know, I'm really sad because I feel like I'm still not living my purpose. And she said, you know, I just saw somebody who's doing network spinal and I really think you should look into it. So I don't know anything about it. I've heard about it in school. I thought it was really weird the first time that I saw it. It looked like people were doing exorcism, and I just didn't think it was science. (laughs) When you say that it looked like an exorcism, what do you mean by that? It looked like people were just, like somebody was like lightly touching them, and then people were moving and making sounds, and it just looked really weird. Okay, not not your typical chiropractic adjustment. Not at all. And 
I thought that if I were to study that, it would be a shame to, to be a chiropractor. So then I really didn't want to do that. Mm-hmm. But then interestingly enough, I go to my room, I'm reading a book, it's called Everything You Need to Know to Feel Good by Dr. Candace Pert. She's a neuroimmunologist, somebody I admired all my years at neuro- when I was studying neuroscience. Mm-hmm. She's the person who discovered the endorphin receptor. And also she discovered that every experience that we have is basically peptides binding to receptors, all these chemical reactions create our experiences. So I loved her. So, and... One sec. Um, and Candice Pert is the one who wrote Molecules of Emotion, which became a really, really famous book for quite a while after the, the movie... Um, what the Bleep Do what We the Know. What the Bleep Do We Know, right? Yes. It's the same one. Yeah, same one. Yeah. This is her so second the, the book and her was, last book. The Bleep was Molecules. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And then she went in and talked about the peptides and, you know, how we have so many receptors in our spinal cord. And it just started to make sense. And then I realized this is what I want to do. So I have been um, studying network and I have been delivering network and I have been receiving it. And it's been probably the biggest healing modality for myself and also for my family. I've gotten all my family members to wow. do network. So I found, I finally found my answer. Interesting. And, and just... There's probably a lot of people, uh, myself included, that don't really understand how network spinal analysis came about. Like, what, what was the, the impetus to, to kind of bring that to be? Who did it and, and, and why? And what, what, was it, what was the origin of that? Dr. Donnie Epstein, uh-huh. um, he was also a chiropractor and a very magical man, a very smart man. Um, he studied different types of Uh, chiropractic techniques and network the reason it's called network is because it is different types of technique all combined together but what he noticed is that these light touches along the spine created this movement and this breath that people started to take a really deep breath and people started to move in these strange ways so he came he discovered it and he was the one who taught it he's still teaching it um, he still has all his seminars where it's open to public and people can receive network from his staff and himself. Mm. So um, he was he was the start of all of it. Mm. I've I've seen him on some video, only only some video, and it's really fascinating to see it. He also struck me as a really fascinating individual. You know, something a little different about him. I, mm. I like him. He's mm-hmm. like the kind of guy I want to just hang out with and spend time with. There's just something about him. I, I found him a little bit magnetic. He's kind of cute in, in a way too, <laughs> yeah. you know? Um, uh, he's but, not lacking in personality, is he? No, he's got he's a lot of personality. Of, full of, um, like, bigger can, than life can, almost. Yeah, you can tell he's a very different person. He seems to be wired a little differently, you mm-hmm. know, than, than the average Joe. Um, uh, for anybody who hasn't seen this though, I mean, I'm just going to describe what I saw. First of all, I didn't know what the hell I was looking at. Right, but it was cool. It was it was fascinating. I, I immediately thought, like, what is this? What is this happening? And it looked like you know he just barely touches somebody, and the person's sort of writhing and twisting and turning, and you know what I mean. I'm thinking, what happened? Like, is the is the person like is this like out of control, or is you know um, is the person moving voluntarily or involuntary or a combination of both? And you know, um, I didn't know what to make of it. And so, uh, but it does seem pretty magical. You know, I mean, that was my experience looking at it. Um, can you shed a little light on that? That's sure. Yeah. What, what are... When I first <clears> saw <throat> it, I thought it was really weird too. I'm telling you, I saw what it was and then I went and sat in the back of the class and I wanted to just study my biochem and be left alone. I didn't want it to look at it because looking at the people who were receiving it and moving made me feel uncomfortable. And it's, it was because I've never seen anything like that. But then as I received the work myself... I just, it just felt like things were shedding away and I was, I was able to release things that I didn't even remember, but I could just feel them being released from my body through the movement. So I'm going to talk about it scientifically. There are a lot of receptors along our spinal cord and most of the receptors in our body that receive information is touch. So there's different receptors for pressure, tickle, touch, light touch, mm-hmm. um, heat and cold. So our spinal cord has a lot of these receptors. And then by going into specific parts of the spine in a specific fashion, you activate something that's called central pattern generator. Central pattern generator is neurons, the cluster of neurons in the spinal cord that they can create movement without signaling the brain. Mm. So what happens as a result of receiving this work, and it 
doesn't just happen a lot of times on the first visit. It takes a little bit of time and consistency. You start to activate the central pattern generator through breath work and through touch and through just guiding the person going through the process. It is, I believe that some of it is involuntary. It's like when you, you know, when you sleep and you jerk your leg and some of it is voluntary because you just have this urge of wanting to stretch. It starts by mm. activating your breath. So we teach people to go through uh, another thing that do Dr. Epstein developed called uh, somatorespiratory integration. Somato means body, respiratory means breathing. Integration is body and breath together. And that breath work activates the movement, which is called the somatopsychic wave. It's a body-mind wave that allows you to release tension in the spinal cord, tension in the body, and emotional tensions. So they did a study at University of Irvine, and they put electrodes on the brain to see the brain waves and to also see the neurons impulsing. And what they found is as the network wave or the somato somatopsychic wave goes through the spine, people start to have a more coherent nervous system mathematically. So mathematically, your nervous system becomes more coherent, which is why I love using this method along with other things that I do in my office, because I can see that literally it improves someone's blood chemistry, which is mm. really fascinating to me. So it's not just about back pain and neck pain and releasing emotions. It's about helping the organizing intelligence of the body to, to circulate throughout the body, to help the nervous system to connect to the organs so that the organs can function at its optimal level. Dr. Epstein created a reorganizational healing so that the body can reorganize instead of being restored to back what it was before. It's always about upgrading the system so that it can become more coherent and help the person optimize their health. You said the the organizing intelligence of the body, right? Yes. What a great idea. Yeah, you know? I love that idea. Yeah. Um, could you tell us a little more about that? Like, what what is that organizing intelligence of the body? I believe the organizing intelligence of the body is what take you takes you from a two cell organism to a trillion cell organism. I believe that organizing intelligence is what takes the banana that you eat and turns it into the tissues of your body. So literally, it transforms it into a human being. Hmm. That organizing intelligence allows our cells to be in a community so that they can communicate together and be part of what it is. Wow, that's beautiful. So so this intelligence can turn a banana into a human. I so, believe that's what it is. So yeah. it can turn a fearful, uptight, scared jerk into a better version of themselves. Once the person connects to that intelligence, I believe that's mm, possible. Okay, that's yeah. really interesting. It sounds like a very holistic um, um way of going about healing a person rather than um, trying to find a part that's wrong and fixing that part. It's like it's just overlapping systems um, that work within. And, and, and you approach this through touch, various forms of touch and through various forms of breathing. And is there an aspect of that that is self-driven, like where outside of the session and outside of the adjustments or things that you do that, that the the client w patient would do on their own? Yes. Um, so we have the breath work. It's called somatorespiratory integration. Okay. He wrote a book called the 12 stages of healing. And I usually recommend that book as a person go through this, um, process because they can practice those breath work. Okay. The breath works are really interesting. There are 12 different breaths, but each breath represents a different consciousness of healing because every stage that we are in life has a different consciousness. So the first one, for example, is consciousness of suffering. What does it really mean to suffer? And acknowledging that there is a part of us that is suffering. Mm. The second stage is polarity. Acknowledging that we have different parts. There is polarity within us. And as a result, we project that polarity into other people. And just acknowledging it is very empowering. Mm. And then the third stage is stuckness. You know, acknowledging, amplifying that there is a part of me that's stuck. And we literally go into the part of the body that we feel stuck and say, I am stuck, I am stuck, screaming, I am stuck, and just amplifying it so the person can, and then they say, oh my God, this part that was feeling stuck is no longer stuck, which is really, and then we take the person to taking your power back. I'm actually doing a retreat where I'm taking the individuals into the 12 stages of breath work uh, in one day, wow. because I find it very powerful tool for people when they go through stages of suffering, polarity, stuckness, and so on. So I've got a question. Yeah. Um, usually somebody goes to see a chiropractor because their back hurts or their neck hurts. Or they have migraines or something, right? 
Um, I imagine you get those people. Most of the time. Do they have any idea what they're in for? They have no idea. <laughs> it's really interesting. They, most people come to me for neck pain and back pain. That's the most common reason. Recently, I'm getting a lot of autoimmune conditions because people are referring to me. But generally, in the beginning especially, I was getting a lot of back pain. And what's interesting, after 10 sessions, they tell me, you know, all of these other issues have been resolved. And I never thought that you would be able to help me. So wow. I had this lady who came in. She had a stroke. So half of her face had no facial expression because that nerve wasn't working. And after five sessions, both her, both of her, uh, both sides of her face are symmetrical, mm. working properly, which is pretty amazing. Wow! And that is she amazing. was not even she. She gave up on that healing of her face because the doctors mm. told her it's never possible. Yeah. So now she has the integrity of the nervous system on both sides, and I'm not surprised because if the nervous system is working, then she should be able to use both of her side, side of her face and those nerves are what controls the uh, muscles of the face mm. so they were they were they got activated and she came in for a back pain but mm. as a result her facial palsy is now yeah. improved wow wonderful I, i'm just out of curiosity how long ago was her stroke when she, before she started the oh, treatment oh years ago really i wow. think it was wow. she said maybe in 2000s 2000 yeah. wow yeah. and this so right now this is 2019 yeah. so and she only time. saw me for 10 sessions she uh, she no longer has fibromyalgia. Her facial palsy is gone, and her balance is gone. Now, I still do some brain exercises for with most people because neuroscience has always been my passion. But network spinal takes care of a lot of it because one, just breathing through your spine helps the the spinal fluid to move. It activates different parts of the nervous system because you're moving and you're breathing. But uh, so as a result, a lot of other conditions improve because everything is controlled by our nervous system. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say um, uh, that is really impressive that many years later for her paralysis to absolutely to go away. You know, usually in um, in the therapy field, if somebody has something major that happens, like a stroke, we usually talk about the six month rule, which is at six months you have a pretty good idea that this is about where they're going to be. They could still get a little bit better over the next year or a few years, perhaps, but not very much. That's that's sort of the standard. Throw your hands in the air after six months. You kind of have a pretty good idea where they're going to be. So 18 or 19 years later to have somebody get better. You know, the new really research that really shows that our nerves have the capacity of growing, our brain has a capacity of changing. You know, we have the neuroplasticity. So maybe that was the case when we didn't know that. But today mm. we do know that you can change your brain. Mm. mentioned earlier spinal breathing breathing into the spine um you know you're talking to people who do things like that but i bet you there are people who listen to the show who go how the hell could you breathe into your spine you breathe into your lungs what the hell does that mean breathing into your spine so what are we talking about here so your lungs go all the way back um and they cover most of your back Mm -hmm. So you are breathing into your lung, but you can actually direct your breath in different parts of you. So literally, if I were to tell you, start breathing, and this is an exercise that you have to do a few times to get better, but you can literally direct your breath at your toe, and you will feel your toe so much better. So it's not that you're like sending oxygen there literally, but you're starting to create awareness in your toe with your breath. By just thinking that I'm directing my breath to my toe, even though the breath is not literally going to your toe, but you are st starting to feel your toe. So when I tell people to direct their breath at their different vertebrae in the spine, it actually allows for the elongation of the spine. So it really helps people who have bulging disc. It really helps people who have no connection from their spinal cord to their organs. So it helps them just connect with them. And then it starts to generate that, that starts to activate the central pattern generator for movement within the spine. Um, there is a lot of studies that shown that people who have experienced trauma, especially rape if they were a child, the somatosensory cortex of their brain, which is a part of the brain that um, perceives different parts of the body, starts to disconnect, to f disconnect and not be able to actually perceive different parts of the body. So one of the coolest things that I've, I've been able to help people, especially people who have been through trauma, rape, 
sexual abuse, um, physical abuse, is that they are starting to develop this beautiful self-awareness of different parts of their body. And imagine having, having more self-awareness of your body. Hmm. There is so much more you can do because you have more access and you have more access to your resources that are within you. And I believe that it allows you to have access to that organizing intelligence we talked earlier because it is within everything else. You'll be able to connect with those resources in different parts of your body just through your breath and just through awareness of knowing exactly what your toe feels like, hmm. what your hip feels like. And as a result of that awareness, when you're doing something, you are, have a less chance of injuring it because you, you know that you are in your body. You have awareness of different parts of your body. I love that because there are, there are definitely... Um uh, at least in my experience, of people that are like a section of society that, that kind of self-identify as, I'm not in touch with my body. And mm -hmm. there are people who don't even know they're not in touch with their body who are told by their spouse, you're not in touch with your body, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and exercises where you could actually get better at that seem really, really useful. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How does this whole thing connect to the idea of functional medicine? Because you mentioned functional medicine earlier. Yeah, so I believe that network spinal is part of the puzzle when we want to help somebody. So when somebody comes in with Hashimoto, which mm -hmm. is the disease of the thyroid gland, it's when the thyroid gland starts to attack itself. It's an autoimmune disease of thyroid gland. Mm -hmm. You can just do network spinal and hope that they get better. A lot of times when I look at their lab work, they do get better, but it's not the answer. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I order lab work for them. I look at all of their hormones. I look at their white blood cells, red blood cells, viruses, bacteria, and once they go through network spinal, their body goes from a state of sympathetic or fight and flight to a state of parasympathetic, which goes into a state of healing. They are, most, they are more likely to absorb nutrients. They, are more, they have the energy to cook food for themselves and to <laughs> follow up and be compliant. And once they get through that um, 20 sessions, the first 20 sessions, and they're more compliant, they have more energy, then I take them through the functional medicine, which is usually some kind of detox that is customized based on what they need, um, based on their blood work, and also recommending some supplementation, just really, really getting into the root cause of the issue. For most people who have um, Hashimoto, I have found that a lot of them have Epstein-Barr virus. So wow. when the Epstein, because the Epstein-Barr virus has the tendency to cause a lot of autoimmunity, actually uh, multiple sclerosis has shown to be caused by Epstein-Barr virus. So I try to see if they have, if they've had mono before, if they have symptoms of virus becoming activated, they have night sweats or something that shows that the virus has become activated. Usually a lot of these people, they have a really stressful time and then their thyroid is destroyed as a result of the autoimmunity. So by just targeting the immune system, a lot of times their Hashimoto goes away to the point wow. where they can actually, we can say that you don't, you no longer have Hashimoto. I'm not claiming that I cure Hashimoto. I'm not a medical doctor, but I do believe by supporting the natural mechanism of the body, we can help a lot of people overcome their autoimmune disease that most of the time that they're told that they have to deal with it for the rest of their life. I don't believe it's true because I see it in my office that people are able to overcome this. Mm -hmm. It just takes time and it takes consistency and changing lifestyle, but it's definitely possible because our immune system uh, it's, it wants to work for us. But a lot of times when we lose our connection with our body, when we lose the connection to the organizing intelligence, it's not able to. But I truly believe that network spinal, along with functional medicine, some kind of detox, supporting their immune cells, they can overcome a lot of their diseases that they were once told it was not curable. Well, I like that idea too. Just, I mean, take it out of the legal terminology and just kind of look at it generally, eliminating or overcoming dis-ease. I mean, that's exactly, if, if you no longer have disease, whether or not <clears throat> you're curing is a whole technical, legal, jargony right. kind of issue to have. But if they're no longer suffering and there's no sign of it, really, um, it's kind of like, yay for network spinal and for the functional medicine and all things that you did, because regardless, that person is no longer feeling dis-ease. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. You said that you also do genetic analysis. Yeah. What kinds of things would a person want to find out about in that category? So there is a lot of ways you can play with the genes. Uh -huh. um, I don't do where you tell somebody that you have the predisposition of getting MS or something, mm. because I don't like to put the consciousness of disease in anyone's mind. I don't like to diagnose people. I don't like to label them. So that's not what I do. But what I do is I look at their genes and I look at what, what did they get from both parents 
And what are they not producing as far as the biochemical pathways goes? I love biochemistry. So I look at to look at the biochemical pathway and see what enzyme is not being produced or it's being produced at a lower rate and then supporting that person with um, supplements that would or food that would help them produce that specific enzyme. Or maybe they're producing too much of something and then they need to decrease certain foods that would cause that production overproduction of something. So it's really interesting because, um, you know, a lot of people have obesity or a lot of people have other hormonal issue and they think they're lazy. They think that it's because they're not eating right. But a lot of these people are eating right. It's just that they're not producing a specific enzyme. They're not metabolizing certain things or they're feeling angry and they think it's like, it's, it's their issue. It's a psychological, but a lot of times it's not psychological. It's because they're producing too much of something that the body doesn't know what to do with it and it causes irritation. So I love helping people to know that they have control over what is being expressed. Our genes, uh, they don't tell us, they're not, they don't tell us what our destiny is. It's the expression of those genes. So supporting people to help the, the expression of the genes epigenetics is one of the best things that I think that a practitioner can do. And you can get those results if you've done ancestry DNA or 23andMe. They already have your uh, raw DNA data, so you can send those to me. I can run it through my software, and I can look at the biochemical pathways and tell you, hey, you know, this vitamin D is something you have to take for the rest of your life because the receptors that are supposed to bind to vitamin D, in your case, you're not producing them at a rate that you should. So you're going to take vitamin D, A, and K to make sure that the absorption is going to be at a higher rate for you because you are predisposed to having low vitamin D. So it could be something really simple, but could make a huge difference in that person's life. Awesome. Mm. Very nice. And so this genetic testing that you do, so this is kind of more through the functional medicine yeah. Uh, pathway, right? Yeah. And uh, this is blood work, I'm assuming, or no? Is there, this is way uh, this is actually a spit test. So okay. you would spit, okay. Okay. and uh, through that spit, they can run your DNA. Okay. And a lot of people already have them because a lot of people did the ancestry DNA. A lot of pe- uh, people are, have already done 23andMe. Yeah, so all they both. do is they send me the results. So you should send your results and just find mm-hmm. out what you mm-hmm. you know. I'll tell you what you cannot eat, what you should eat, and what supplements you may need to just upgrade those biochemical pathways Mm -hmm. biohacking baby yeah biochemical hacking biochemical hacking yeah Yeah. all right yeah so you like biochemistry i love biochemistry. so you're a nerd i am (laughs) okay good because we (laughs) actually made a really good income through chiropractic school because i would sell my notes oh Oh. very good very good (laughs) um so a biochemist neuroscientist chiropractor functional medicine practitioner yes Okay, very good. So we've got the four pillars covered for you. Yes. Um, well, actually, there's another thing that I do. Oh, do Vibroacoustic tell. therapy. So I have a bed that is connected to music. So as you know, we're in an wow. age where we use our phones for music, so we're not really getting the vibration of music. And I love sound mm. therapy. Sound therapy is so powerful. So through using the vibroacoustic therapy, I help a lot of people with Parkinson, people with stroke, because their body is not, their nervous system is not activated. So through the sound therapy, feeling the sound through the vibration, they're actually able to start to feel a lot of parts of their body that it was numb, it was tingling, they weren't feeling it, or they're just feeling like their brain is not working properly and just sound itself can be very healing. Mm, Very nice. Um, Were you inspired to go down that path more from your, your neuroscience training, or is it just something you stumbled upon? How, how does one learn about this and, and, and do this? It was through a book. It was called Brain Vibration, and they talked about sound therapy. And then I went and I received sound therapy, and I thought for one week my brain was just on fire. I was feeling a lot more energy. And I just thought if we are frequencies, which I believe that we are, if we are wave particles and sound ha- has a huge frequency, huge impact on us. And it does. A lot of studies show that, for example, dopamine production, which is a neurotransmitter that helps us feel motivated and p- pleasure is actually produced more when we listen to something that we really enjoy. So I added that to, as part of something that I practice for my patients because mm. I want to be able to produce more dopamine for people. Jeez, sign me up. All right. Heck yeah, that sounds amazing. Yeah. Wow, she's slanging dope, Carlos. She is. She's slanging dope. <laughs> Vibroacoustically. Yeah. Oh, it's very sneaky. It's all very, very, very sneaky. sneaky. Yeah.
Are there times when you do traditional chiropractic work? Is there still a place for that in what you do? I definitely still do it, especially when I feel like someone is not connecting to their body. Then I feel like they really need something strong Mm. to let them feel like this back exists. You have a back. Because some people don't know that they even have a back. They have a mid-back. I just can feel like there is no breath there. There is no connection there. They just feel so disconnected. Mm. So in those cases, especially people who are on medications, psychotropics, uh, people who are anti-anxiety, anti-depression, a lot of times they have no idea of different parts of their body. Because I do believe that some of those medications actually numb people so that it can help them. Um, so a lot of for those people, I do a lot of structural adjustments. Sometimes I do structural adjustments because somebody was on a plane and their, their neck needs an adjustment. But most of the time I don't because network spinal creates those movements in the body where they are self-adjusted. So mm. when the body could do it, then intelligently, then I feel like I, I can't do it the way the body would. The body just knows what the person needs. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, that, that makes a lot of sense. You, you caused me to reflect on something that I do once in a while that I didn't really think much about. Um, so I'm an acupuncturist, right? So I'll put needles in people. And usually I don't put needles locally. Like if somebody has knee pain, I don't usually put needles in their knee. Sometimes I do. You do master tongue points? Um, uh, yeah, I do some master tongue points. Um, uh, I do more um, balance method mm. type mm-hmm. acupuncture. But um, what I found is that there are some people that just who they are and what they expect and what they believe in, they need me to do local points on their knee. Mm, And and it's because that's what they need. They need physical right on my knee or right, just stick a needle right in the middle of that knot that I have. And I'm, and you know, and, and I realize that there's a time and place for that. Sometimes that's what somebody needs at that moment, you know? And so, yeah, but I don't usually do that. It's kind of like what you said. You wouldn't usually do that, but once in a while it's called for. Yeah. 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 So, so since you understand meridian points, then it would make only it would make sense for you to understand that work, just because you know you're using energetic systems of the organs. We're using the energetic system of the spinal cord. Yeah, and I was kind of hoping we could talk some about that, right? Because um, um, in acupuncture, there are times when you put a needle in and you do strong stimulation and you needle deeply, and there are times when you barely put the needle in. You just barely touch the skin. Um, or sometimes a needle's not even called for. Sometimes you're not putting pressure on the skin. Sometimes you're sucking up the skin, right? And so there's, there's a wide range of what you, you could possibly do with somebody. Um, so one question that I have is with the spinal network analysis, when you do the, the, the touching, you know, whatever that technique is, mm-hmm. right? Um, is it always along the spine or are there other parts of the body that you do it to I also? use other parts. So okay. One of the things that I have to do as a practitioner is to be extremely present with the person on the table because I am learning that sometimes the points are different from what I would expect them to be because everybody else is different. So that presence, being so present with that person, understanding when do they take a really, really deep breath? When do they start to stretch? When do they start to moan and make a sound and express themselves? And I take notes on that because sometimes there will be points that are not along the spine and it would be in different places. So I use a lot of points on legs actually and on Mm. arms, even though that's not something I've learned in school, but I can just say as soon as I put my hand in this person in a specific place, they start to calm down. I can just see their body release tension. So I just believe that the power of touch and self, if I just touch them with intention, if I just touch them with love, that in itself is so powerful for them to heal. So it's, it's, it's an art of using what I've learned, but also what I'm experiencing with that person and just understanding what they need. Maybe they just want me to hold their head because that's what they need that day. Mm -hmm. So then it's, it's really being intuitive, but more than being intuitive, being really present and understanding what this person needs. Yeah. Very nice. Okay. I've noticed from what little I've seen in videos that a lot of the touch points seemed to be up like by the Cervical, base of the yeah, skull neck. or the mm-hmm. neck or down by the sacrum or yeah. just from what little I've seen. Yeah. Is that common? Is that often? Is that usually where the practitioners will, yeah. will go to? Okay. Yeah, because uh, your neck and your sacrum is the place where you have the most amount of nerves. Right, and that's, that's going to be your um, parasympathetic, correct? Yes. And the, the sympathetic chain is going to be more thoracic, right? Yes. And then up by cervical and sacral 
is more parasympathetic, right? So for those who are hearing us talk, we're, we're talking shop a little bit, right? Yeah. So remember, parasympathetic is rest and digest, and sympathetic is fight or flight, yes. right? Um, so does that have something to do with why it's often cervical and, and sacral? Yes, and also mm-hmm. because most of the nerves are coming from those areas. Okay, yeah. okay. Wow, very nice. You know, um, this is kind of fun to share, right? Um, I, I When I learned this, once upon a time studying anatomy years and years ago, when I learned that um, these are the two major areas where you get most of the, the uh, information from the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, I thought, well, gosh, if I'm feeling more of a fight or flight response, I know that most of those signals were coming more from like the thoracic part, like, you know, upper back, upper mid back area. If I just put my focus on my neck and my sacrum, it usually calms me down. Hmm. Only putting my mind on my neck and my sacrum, I start to feel that parasympathetic, you know, response take over my body. Another thing you can do is go into extension. Because oh, when we're yeah. afraid, we always go into flexion and, we, you know, mm. our shoulders are forward, we move forward, we want to protect our hearts. Mm. But if you just allow yourself to go into extension, open up your heart, open mm. up your arms, and just as if you're, you know, praying to God or just opening up your heart, you'll mm. immediately feel a shift. And also you can see, you know, this is something you can observe in other people. If they're happy, if they're sad, just by looking at their posture, are they, do they have more rounded shoulders or are they more mm. open? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, at Toastmasters, when people are speaking, you can tell, like, are they really connecting to the audience because their heart is open, or are they not connecting because their posture is a, more of a close posture? Mm, wow, wow. Uh, thank you for that. I love to extend. I like to want to extend yeah. more. Yeah. yeah. You know what's funny? I've noticed, just since we're on the topic, um, uh, I, I tend to be long-waisted, right? I, most of my height is in my trunk, right? So I always say I'm a minion. My legs and arms are a little shorter, probably. I have like a bigger man's trunk and like a shorter man's limbs. So um, I have a lot, of, a lot of, I have to make a lot of adjustments with my, my trunk you know, to look at things, to you know, duck down, right? And so um, I often need to extend, you know, a bit to open up. And uh, what I found is that when I keep trying to straighten my spine, it's work. But instead, if I think, don't straighten your spine, just open up your front. It automatically fixes my posture. And when I realize my posture is not good, it's like, oh, I'm not opening up for my heart or my solar plexus. Or, Mm. you know, I'm trying to straighten my spine rather than just opening up the front. Ah, Just something that has been really, really nice that I thought I'd share. You know, because it's it's worked well for me, you know. You found a hack. Yeah, it's a hack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Speaking of hacks... Mm -hmm. Um, you said something um, about paying attention and really um, being present. Being present, mm-hmm. yeah, with your with your clients. How do you do that personally? I think it's the love that I have for the person who's in my office. It's realizing that these are the people that support my business. These are the people that support my dream. So when they come in, they are the king and queens of my office. Mm. because I have such deep love for them, not only because they're supporting me, but because they're trusting me, I am immediately there for them. And it doesn't matter if I'm sick. It doesn't matter if something bad has happened. When I'm in my office, when I'm in that room and somebody else is on my table, I'm immediately extended. I'm Mm. immediately, my heart is open. I'm immediately, I know that I'm in the mode of service. Mm. And it doesn't, I don't have to think about it. It's just you're it's in the zone. Hard. I'm in the zone. It's just my natural state because mm. I love serving and I love connecting them to this resource within them. And I love to teach them that they are the heroes. You know, I feel like most of the time as a practitioner, we want to be the heroes and we, t- you know, we use the fear factor and use their pain points and make them feel like they need us. But for me, my biggest mission is to teach them that they are the hero, that the healer is inside them, that the resource is inside them because they can always access that. And um, just, just having that love for them, this deep love for the people who come in and immediately, like once, I'm, it doesn't matter if they just met them once, as soon as they're there and I know that I'm in the service, it's, it's just so natural for mm. me to feel that way. Wow. You know, um, not only hearing you describe that, but actually seeing you describe that. Sh- really, I, I'm sure Carlos is noticing all this, right? Um, mm-hmm. That uh, it sounds to me, I get, the, I get the impression from you that your presence is very somatic, yeah. very body-based mm-hmm. presence, really coming from your, your heart, you know, when yeah. you're, when you're, when you're uh, with somebody. Um, uh, 
Carlos, what about you? How, how do you stay present with, with your clients? Well, it, it's similar um, for the same, kind of some of the same reasons, actually. Uh, one of the things about flow state that I've learned is that if you make it not about you, you are much um, more inclined to slip into a natural flow state. You know, of course, a flow state is a, is a state of, of high performance where you, um, if you know what you are practicing or doing well enough, then you can actually trust your intuition to guide you. It's not like you're asking your intuition to do something with nothing. You're asking your intuition to do something with the palette and with the toolbox that you have available to you. So if you are really making it about them, then you can respond actively to what is there rather than what you might be projecting. And also, it's not about uh, making yourself more comfortable or, or trying to do self-comforting gestures and movements and thoughts. It becomes totally about them and therefore um, much easier to stay in the moment with them. Um, because I care about the person who's in front of me, um, then naturally, uh, if I'm there to serve them, then my thoughts are for them, not for me. Yeah. And if I ever slip out of that or off of that, I quickly come back to being present because it is literally about them yeah. in that moment. It, and later on, of course, there's parts that are about you, like how did I do and reflecting on what could I have done better or did I get hung up on anything or, you know, what did I feel back there a, a moment ago? You know, there's times when I will go back into myself, but it is really about um, putting my, nerv my nervous awareness as if it's projected out beyond me. And so that's very, very important. Yeah, and I mm, truly yeah. believe that the love that is present between me and the patient, mm. that is probably the most powerful force for their healing. Yep. There is the supplements and there is a diet, but that love, that presence, that space, creating that space and for them to, to feel safe, to express themselves however it is that they need to express themselves, that's where the healing really happens. It's not in, it, the supplements help, all the other things help, but I think that that is the most important element, at least for me. When I really see somebody heal, I know that it was because they felt so loved, they felt so supported, they felt like the space was there for them to grow and experience all these different parts, all this, the fact that I don't ever judge them, the fact that I don't care if their feet smells, I don't care how they look, I'm there to serve them, and they can feel that. And in that space, they start to develop self-love for themselves and take care of themselves. You're getting huge nods from, from uh, Satch and I. We, yeah, we talk yeah. about uh, therapeutic use of self, which is a, a concept that Satch taught me from occupational therapy that uh, derived originally from uh, psychotherapy. And, and this whole idea that, that more than the techniques you use, more than the exercises you give, and like you said, more than the supplements, is um, the care and the connection and the relationship that is built between you and the person Absolutely. that helps them as a bridge, an affect bridge for them to actually heal themselves. Absolutely. You know, the, the fact mm -hmm. that they know that you believe in them and that you're showing up and, and they have an expectation of doing well for you. And there's just so many different layers of stuff that go into it, and, and that go into the process of healing, that therapeutic use of self is, is really, yeah. like you say, loving them. It's really quite simple. Caring, right? Yeah. Caring and connection mm -hmm. and being there. Yeah. I've also yeah. created something else in the office. So one thing is that they take off their shoes. Mm -hmm. So it looks like a home. Like when you come into the office, it looks like a home. And I also never wear the white coat because I believe mm -hmm. that you can cause white coat syndrome oh, where yeah. people Amen. actually get oh, anxious. Yeah. Yeah. I don't wear mine either. I hate that thing. And yeah. I always introduce <laughs> myself as Tara. I don't say I'm Dr. Tara. And I don't care if they call me doctor or not doctor because I earned that title. But what is really important to me that they feel like they're at a friend's house that I'm here as their mm. family member to support them because I think that's really what the healing is about. They will know my expertise. I feel people are very smart. They will look at you. They'll talk to you for 15 minutes. They can tell if you're smart, if you know your stuff or not. But they, you know, I don't need to <clears throat> act like an authority because I don't think that's healing. For me to act like an authority and they're stupid and they don't know and I know because I'm the doctor, I think that can actually have the opposite effect of them not being able to heal. I think that healing happens in empowerment. And that empowerment is so much stronger when you act like a friend than, than a doctor. So that's another thing that I've, I've been integrating. And a lot of people ask me, you know, you look like a little girl. You don't have the white coat. Like you're going with your flowery dress to work. And I say, I want them to think I'm their friend. 
that's what I really care about. I don't care about acting like I'm better than them. I went to school or anything else. Mm. You know, I, I respect that a lot. Um, I was going to say this earlier when, when you were mentioning how you're still studying. Um, you know, Satch can totally relate to this because we are, uh, him and I are lifelong learners. Yeah. It doesn't matter how much we know uh, or what we studied or anything like that. We are going to be constantly diving in like beginners, wanting to learn. And so we really respect people who have um, not only humility, but an appreciation for wanting to learn things. Yeah. And you have that. So I know you're brilliant and, and your, your desire to continue learning and, and making yourself the student, even though you're also the doctor, which means teacher, right? Yeah. That's wonderful. That makes me have even more respect for what you, what you do. Thank you. That's really cool. Yeah. yeah, I was looking at someone's blood work today and I literally went to my book because I'm like, I want to double check and triple check and make sure that what I'm going to say to this person is true because sometimes I forget. Mm. And even though what I was thinking, I was still on the right path, it was cool to just go to my books and look at the ranges and just refresh because I think we all need it. And I think that's what happens when a lot of people don't get better when they go to doctors, because mm -hmm. I think a lot of times doctors get really cocky. They mm -hmm. think they know, but they don't. Research and science is constantly changing. What we didn't know yesterday, we know today. So mm -hmm. I think staying up to date, going to school, going to seminars, constantly going back and searching the literature is really important. And that's what people need. You know, our blood work, the way it's done today, they will only check things that if you, ha you are really, really sick, you have to be really, really sick for them to check everything. And I don't think that's right. Because no. a lot of times when I look at someone's blood work, I tell them, you know, every all these range, they're kind of at the end of the range, you know, either the lower range or the higher range. And I really worry that something is going on. So let's do let's go a little bit deeper. And usually when I do go deeper, and I order all the extra things that the insurance doesn't pay for, mm -hmm. it shows up. Because it takes about 5, 10 years, 20 years for the person to really have Hashimoto or for the person to really develop cancer. So I think it's as a practitioner, it's really, really important for us to dig deep. If there is one thing that is out of range, we have to ask the question, why? Why is it out of range? Not just give them supplement, but to really understand what's the root cause. And See, see that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. from, a, from just being a, a rational human being, that makes so much sense to my intellect. Like, why would you not want to discover if there was something that you could change course now that would take less energy than to try to change course at the end when you're you're so close to the problem now it's going to take this massive amount of energy to prevent a disaster versus early on you know it's just the same old story you know it's like putting mm -hmm. money away in a bank you know yeah. you start early you know you do your best or at least you start when you are aware that you can make a start you know yeah. So those people who are listening to this, well, you're hearing it now. So you have an opportunity to think about that, just to reflect on, you know, am I going to wait until there's this huge problem or am I going to go into a loving, friendly environment with someone who could actually take a look and just see, you know, what's going on? I mean, people run with this assumption that, oh, I'm feeling like crap, but it's okay. I'm not sick, but I just feel like crap, but... Yeah, you know, this is just how it is. Because I, I work a long week and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and yeah, you know, whatever's going on. Yeah. Whether it's like bowel problems or depression or acne or whatever it is that's going on. They're just like thinking, well, there's nothing to be done about it. Because they've been sort of brainwashed by their upbringing and their society that, that you know, you're only supposed to go to the doctor when something is severely wrong. Yeah. Instead of preemptively saying, am I really supposed to be feeling like this like yeah. maybe you could feel 10 times better right just by doing a little preemptive work and some exploration with someone like you, you yeah know, that that's i don't know to me that makes sense yeah they call yeah. me crazy but <laughs> yeah um well, well yeah oh my we're god all, we're all crazy, crazy together <laughs> um one of the things that drives me nuts right is so uh, as an acupuncturist i'm an outsider of in, in the american medical field right as an occupational therapist i get to be an insider so sometimes I'm an insider and sometimes I'm an outsider, okay? Sometimes um, you're an outside insider. That's true. That's true. Um, as an acupuncturist, people tend to believe me more because I'm also an insider. But when I'm an insider, they think it's more neat than I'm an outsider. So I'm all confused about the whole thing. You know, I'm already but, in trance. Just tell right. me what to do. <laughs> just talk about it. Okay. <laughs> right. yes, be sir. happy, Carlos. Just smile and be happy. Okay. Oh, my God. I feel happy right um, now. So as an in when I'm an insider, okay, in the medical field... 
one of the things that absolutely drives me batty is, and I've seen it again and again and again and again and again, right? I'll see these amazing transformations happen where a person who's on the brink of death is walks out of the facility and they're fine, right? It blows me away. But then I'll meet people that go to try to get help and they're told something like this. Um, okay, well, you know, everything doesn't look too bad, but if it gets worse, make sure you come back. Uh, yeah. mm-hmm. and that drives me nuts, yeah. right? And so there's, this, there's a donut hole, hmm. right? If you're relatively <clears throat> healthy, great, good for you. If you're somewhat sick, not much we can do. If you're really sick, okay, then I can help you. Yeah. And that's okay. Thank goodness that there's that, right? <laughs> because if I'm really sick, I want that help, right? If anybody's sick, they want that help. Um, but it is frustrating when there isn't much to offer when the person is kind of sick. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, uh, and that's what we're talking about here, yeah. mm-hmm. right? Is, yeah. is those people that um, uh, would rather not wait till it gets so bad they have to finally make that appointment or go ahead and bite the bullet and see the specialist or finally talk about that surgery, that elective yeah. surgery, you know, it's just, and it can be something really simple. I had a patient, she came in and she said, if you can't help me, I'm planning to kill myself. I can't Yikes. live like this anymore. She wow. said, I have five kids. I cannot get up and give them breakfast. They go to school without having breakfast. And I've gone to all the doctors and they don't know what's wrong with me. And my hair is falling out. I'm really tired. I don't know what to do. So I look at their blood work. It's kind of complete. But I say, you know what? I don't see your ferritin. So ferritin is a marker of when the iron gets stored in the liver. Mm -hmm. Based on the blood work that was done, she doesn't have anemia, iron deficiency anemia. So I say, hey, let's just order this one one more thing and just see what happens. I order her ferritin. It's supposed to be, based on lab range, it's supposed to be greater than 20. I like it to be around 50. Hers is at two. And mm. I said, oh my God, you are extremely iron deficient. I order her a very potent iron supplement and she takes it for two weeks. She comes back and she said, oh my God, you gave my life back. Mm. It was so simple. And that would have been missed if you had only based it on whatever what the was blood work. was already done. Yeah, and, and yeah. probably most doctors would have missed that. Yeah. I mean, let's because be fair. Because they don't order it. Because yeah, it's nothing. not something that they usually order. It, it, they and it don't does, think it's, about it, it. None of the red flags for a regular medical doctor would be there, right? Yeah. As far so as you know what she got? She got antidepressant for mm. months and months. She was an antidepressant and, and she all she need needed that. was iron. Yeah, wow. So it's really important to look at a little bit deeper. You know, um, like it could be something really simple. But then the question was, why was her iron so low? Well, she decided to be vegan because she uh. wasn't already feeling good. So, and I'm not saying that all vegans get sick, but I'm saying that mm. sometimes you need, if you're going to be a vegan, you really need to understand how you need to eat and what you need to take so that you don't mm-hmm. get so sick. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's simple. Some, the solution sometimes it's really simple, but it's overlooked. Where do you do this magic? I'm right by Disneyland in Anaheim, 607 South Harbor Boulevard, Anaheim. I'm at a spiritual center. I really love where I'm at because there is a lot of magic in the building. Mm. I uh, feel aligned um, of being there because I believe that they're constantly praying, yoga, qigong, um, and I just feel very aligned being there. And the two ladies that own the body studio, that's where I work, they're very... They're very beautiful. They're very kind people. And people who work there get free treatments from me because nice. I love for them to experience what I do. Lucky them. And yeah, yeah. I All can't right. wait. We'll have to get a job there. Carlos. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to sign up tomorrow. So Tara, you mentioned earlier about this retreat. And I, I meant to ask you earlier, but can you tell us more about that? What it's going to be? When is it going to yes. happen? The retreat is happening September 7th okay. in Long Beach mm-hmm. at Toby Gant's house. He's a soul coach. And I know Toby. Yes. Yeah, so okay. him and I are doing a joint event where we're providing organic food. And not joints. Not joints. Okay. It's a joint <laughs> event, but we're not providing that. It's right. food. It's okay. organic so food. Be clear. Uh, and we're going to go through the stages of healing 
by Dr. Donnie Epstein. We're going to teach people about the wow. stages of healing, wow. practice, practice them, but also integrate yoga and meditation so that we could really anchor and understand what these stages of healing are about. So what did you guys say earlier? Like you are really getting into it. Uh-huh. Get not into not it, just not getting through it. through it, but getting into getting it. Getting into it yeah. and um, just helping people understand what the stages are about so that they can teach it to others when it comes up and they can really experience it for themselves. That's exciting. Um, and, and what's the cost involved in this? It's 250 for the mm-hmm. whole day. It's from 10 a.m. to 5. But if you bring a friend, you get $50 off and your friend gets a $50 off. So it's 200 for each. Mm. Wow. That Sounds is good. a freaking wow. steal that is for fantastic. what we're learning. That's yeah. really yeah. amazing. I do a yeah. lot of workshops and things like that. That is seriously an amazing deal. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. How do people um, sign up? Um, I can provide a link. They, it's also on Eventbrite. It's called Reclaiming Your Power Through Somatograde. That's what the work is about. It's called Somatograde. It's somatorespiratory integration, just in one word. Or they can go to shekholistic.com, S-H-E-K, holistic.com, at Toby Gant's website, find Somatograde, and sign up there. It's actually cheaper there. And Somatograde, how's that spelled? It's S-O-M-A-T-E-G-R-A-T-E. Got it. Okay, cool. And of course, um, as usual, we, we like people to know how to find you. So what is the best way? Like, do you have like social media? How, how's it? I'd like people to call me. My okay. phone number is 714-679-8608. I'd like anybody who wants to come talk to me, just know you can come get tea with me. Just text me and let me know when it's a good time. We'll have a friendly tea. I would love to help you. Tea with Tara. Tea with Tara. And... You can come to the office. We'll get some tea during my lunchtime or if I'm not working. And you can see if you're a good fit. Wonderful. Mm-hmm. Wow, this has been great. Great conversation. Thank it's you. lovely to have you here. My website is www.drtararasta.com. It's D-R-T-A-R-A-R-A-S-T-A. You can also email me, dr.t-a-r-a-r-a-s-t-a at gmail.com. I would love to connect. It'll be a great time. Beautiful. Mm. This has been lovely. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to The Authenticity Show with your hosts, Carlos Casados and Satch Purcell. Very special thanks to our guest today, Dr. Tara Rasta. If you want to find out more about Tara, you can find her website at drtararasta.com. That's D-R-T-A-R-A-R-A-S-T-A.com. Or like she said, give her a call or a text on her cell phone, which is 714-679-8608. My name is Oliver Altine. I record, edit, and produce this show. I also wrote the theme music, which you're listening to right now. And the interstitial music for this episode was a tune we're calling Space Monkey, which was written by my good friend Jeremy Hatch and performed by Jeremy Hatch, myself, and Evan Kilborn on drums, and recorded in the very room where I'm recording this, which is my garage in the city of Orange, California. Please subscribe to our show wherever you get your podcasts, find us on social media, leave us a comment, throw us a like, all that stuff helps. And you can find our website at AuthenticityShow.com. Thanks for listening, and have an authentic day.